Good morning. Happy Tuesday. I have neuro coffee in hand and it is perfect. It is Tuesday, big clinic day. Um, Got to get going here. So we're going to dive right into the Q&A if it's okay with you. Um, this one comes from Austin. And Austin says, a lot of rehab professionals prescribe exercises that are intended to target deep musculature around the joints. Exercises like shoulder, extra rotations come to mind. So he's talking about like the, you know, the rubber bandy exercises that they do for like rotator cuff rehab and things like that. Based on your model, could it be that by strengthening the deep muscles, what is actually happening is a greater ability to maintain pressure and volume around the joint and allow relative motion to occur while limiting the impact of the superficial compression. If not, what would you attribute to the success of such prescriptions? Austin, I want, this is a great, great question because, um, again, the, the behavior of synovial joints is, is really important to understand, especially with any exercise prescription, but especially with, with things like these, because when this type of an activity is useful and it does have utility, um, it's usually because of the exact reason that you state is that we're actually capturing relative motions. So I think it's been misguided that there's strengthening going on, and I won't deny that there's potential for hypertrophy and force production and things like that, but I don't think that, that these activities are remotely important for such things because from a load perspective, um, there's not a whole lot of overloading going on here, but what there is is a lot of coordinative activity that becomes incredibly useful to recapture normal synovial joint function. So, so we need to start um, thinking about how that works. So let's just touch on that briefly. When we talk about any synovial joint, so synovial joints are, are filled with synovial fluid, so we're just going to call that water for the sake of argument. And that water is incompressible. And so for, for a synovial joint to move through its normal excursion, I have to be able to create pressure in certain areas so the volume will shift in certain directions to allow movement to occur. So let's use an elbow as an example. So if I compress the front side of my elbow, I create pressure here, the volume moves to the back side of the elbow, and that allows me to bend the elbow. If I put pressure here, I extend the elbow, the volume goes this way, and I can extend the elbow. So all synovial joints behave the same way. And so the, the muscles that are the closest to the joint, and they're actually attached to, to the joint capsules, um, they are the pressure manipulators. So they are the ones that, that are moving these, the, the fluid volumes that allows all of this motion to occur. So if we're doing rotator cuff strengthening exercises, and I, and I, I have to throw the air quotes in there because again, I'm not, I'm not looking at it from that perspective at all what we're actually doing is restoring the ability to move the humerus relative to the scapula and the scapula relative to the humerus and the scapula relative to the thorax and any number of things um, that we have to talk about. So if you look at this from a load perspective, if you look at the typical prescriptions for, for uh, retraining the rotator cuff as it is in the literature, everything is based on a very, very low load and so for very good reason because if we use higher loads, we tend to reduce the relative motion capability. So now we're gonna talk about the superficial musculature because as I ramp up the intensity of an activity based on load, I have to recruit the superficial musculature and that reduces the relative motion between segments. So anytime I have to increase force production to any significant degree, that's exactly what's gonna happen. So now if my intent is to restore normal movement, I'm actually going to restrict that with, with using higher loads. I also have to consider the position of the joint. So if you look at the, again, we'll use rotator cuff literature because it, it, it's prolific. The position of the, of the humerus relative to the body matters in regards to um, what they would say would be EMG activity in, in the rotator cuff musculature. What, what we're going to make reference to is that we have to have a, this humerus in an appropriate position to restore uh, expansion where we need expansion. So for external rotation capabilities, I need to make sure that I can expand dorsal rostral. So if I pin my arm to my side, I've immediately restricted my ability to expand that area. So I'm going to move it away from my side. And typically what you'll see is they'll have some sort of bolster or roll underneath the arm as they're doing these, these activities. And they say, oh, wow, the EMG activity ramps up when the reality is, is, oh, I just created more concentric orientation to allow that relative motion to occur. So that's how we want to start to think about this. 
we think about muscle positions, so concentric to eccentric orientation, where do I need the, the, the concentric orientation to be to allow the fluid volume to shift? So once again, if I'm trying to create more external rotation, I have to create compression on the posterior side of the shoulder so the volume shifts forward and allows that external rotation to occur. Axial position is going to matter. So where do I position the, the thorax to maximize these internal and external rotation capabilities? So if I am allowing someone to perform these activities in a compensatory strategy, so let's just say that I retracted both scapulae and I was performing external rotations, I've actually just compressed the area that I need to expand to allow that external rotation to occur. So I have now failed miserably um, based on my intent and, and so again, we have to take these positions into consideration. Finally, let's superimpose breathing on top of that. So if I hold my breath, I'm gonna reduce my relative motions. Um, if I can't breathe through the exercise, um, I'm not going to be able to create the expansion and compression strategies that I may need to, to restore the ability to turn or rotate. And so again, we have to take all of these things into consideration. So. Again, I would, I would caution everyone to look at these things as strengthening. Um, I would look at them more for the ability to restore the capacity to execute relative motions because that's what's gonna be most important when we're talking about restoring health. Later on, we can superimpose force production on top of anything, which is actually going to reduce those relative motions. But again, that's a totally different story. Austin, thank you so much for this question. I think it's a very useful question. Hope it's useful for you guys as well. Have a great Tuesday, and I will see you tomorrow.